I want to introduce Miss Annie Lori McDonald. In her 20 years in the field of historic preservation, Annie McDonald has worked as a consulting architectural historian, local government planner, and preservation staff for a regional council of governments. She has served on the boards of local and statewide preservation nonprofit organizations and as a consulting educator for the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. Since 2012, Annie has served as the preservation specialist for the 25 county western region of North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office, a division of historical resources, offices of archives and history. That name actually has more letters than the Preservation Society of Asheville and Montgomery County. So it gives me hope. In her role at the North Carolina SHPO, she consults with individuals, local governments, and nonprofit organizations on the agency's architectural surveys and national register programs. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Art History and a Master of Arts in History with a certification in Historic Preservation. I give you Miss Annie McDonald. Um, first of all, I want to thank a few folks who helped, um, who helped with the development of today's event, including volunteers and board members at PSABC, property owners in Homeland Park who shared with me their homes and their stories, and particularly Ruth Salt, who has recently passed but who graciously invited me into her home and shared wonderful memories of her years there over the past 60 years. Um, we're going to back up 200 years from today and start at the, in the early years of the New Republic when architecture fell primarily into one of two camps, either vernacular and based on cultural building traditions that did not exhibit a high level of ornament or architectural style, and highly derivative and based on classical antecedents. This was the case in American architecture until the mid-19th century, when Andrew Jackson Downing published the work the architecture of country houses. And in it, he advocated for the construction of picturesque homes in pastoral, uh, evocative settings, like Italian villas and Gothic revival style cottages. It is impossible to overstate the impact of Andrew Jackson Downing on American architectural history and American architecture of the second half of the 19th century. Ultimately, it culminated in the diversity of the Queen Anne style in all of its various expressions. But it had an immediate impact. And one area where we see the influence of Downing and the picturesque of the mid 19th century is in the work of William West Durant, who was the son of a railroad magnate in upstate New York, who was the progenitor of the great camps architecture of the Adirondack Mountains. He started in 1877 with the development of Camp Pine Knot and continued to build what are called the great camps of the Adirondack Mountains around and on Raquette Lake through the late 19th century. And this is Great Camp Sagamore from 1897. These were largely private camps sold to industrialists, the robber barons of the Gilded Age. And the architecture here is rooted to some degree in the picturesque of Downing, but also Alp the, the picturesque and traditional architecture of Europe, particularly in the Alpine region. You, know, you could just as easily see this in Bavaria. The architecture of the Adirondacks and the great camp movement 
had a significant influence on the national park movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And we see this early on in the construction of Old Faithful Inn in 1903, um, which makes use of log construction, exposed log construction, and log framing elements on the exterior and the interior. And again, in, the, in 1917, in the construction of Paradise Inn at Mount Rainier National Park, while this does not display exposed um, structural log framing, it has exposed log elements in the, on the exterior and on the interior. It's not a load-bearing log structure, but it still has that rustic character. And in North Carolina, uh, we refer to this as the rustic revival style. So we see this both in rustic revival log buildings constructed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but it doesn't necessarily have to be log. It might also be frame and say clad in shingles. And we'll see an example of that momentarily. Enter this dapper gentleman and his Model T and the, um, the, the advent of the automobile age in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the early years of the automobile, getting around was hard. And people were often stuck. The, the wheels of the early automobiles were narrow in part so they could fit into the ruts made by wagon, uh, wagons going down the road. This led to the Good Roads Movement, uh, starting in the late 19th century. And there were associated state organizations. North Carolina had a particularly active Good Roads Movement in the early 20th century. And several states did have similar organizations and um, groups and, and local affiliate groups. In 1909, for example, there was a great endurance race from Tampa to Jacksonville back to Tampa that took four days. It was sponsored by the Tampa Tribune and it brought to light the issues with the roads across Florida. North Carolina, as I said, had one of the most active, and we see here the publication Southern Good Roads, published out of Lexington, North Carolina, discussing the crest of the Blue Ridge Highway in 1912. This image is from 1916, and it's thought to be a caravan of Good Roads advocates um, inspecting the conditions of the road over Hickory Nut Gap. So why, why were people concerned about this? Well, Asheville was vacation central. And one of the things people were, you know, people were building second homes here. And they, people were coming from the low country, from Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, the mid-Atlantic, and the Northeast, flocking to North Carolina. And some of what they were interested, they brought with them their building traditions and what they were interested in. And one of the influences that came to Western North Carolina at this time was the rustic revival style and, and what people were seeing elsewhere in the country. This is an, an early 20th century edition of a publication by William Sidney Wicks who was an architect in upstate New York, who published first in 1889, log cabins, how to furnish, or how to build and furnish them, that provided advice and guidance and plans on rustic revival style log cabins like we see in Homeland Park. This goes back to 1889, and I'm sure it might have been an influence in the design of the log cabin settlement building here in Buncombe County, which dates to 1895. This is, I believe, a Richard Sharp Smith design, and it is, as far as I know, the earliest iteration of a rustic revival style log building in Western North, or in Buncombe County, at least. 
A little later, the Mott family of upstate New York constructed their summer house in Hot Springs. This is not a rustic revival style log building. This is a frame structure that was shingle clad. But you can see here in the railing, in the porch posts, the evidence of the Adirondack influence from a few decades earlier. This is the Singletary Reese Robinson House built in 1912 and perhaps a little more evocative of the settlement houses that we see um, here in Western North Carolina, the earlier log buildings that are hewn. The William Nelson Camp Jr. House constructed in 1926 is less vernacular and maybe a little more um, influenced by the craftsmen and arts and crafts styles, particularly with roof pitch, open eave brackets, the dormers, the overall form. And it culminates in 1935 in what I think is probably the best example of a rustic revival style log building in this entire region, and that's Glenchoga Lodge, built in 1935 in far western Macon County. This house is outstanding on the interior and exterior, and it's recently sold. But you didn't have to be a wealthy person of means building your big fancy summer house to have a rustic revival style log building. A great example of one locally is one that a lot of folks here might know, and that's the Max Whitson cabin um, here in Oteen, um, not too far from Homeland Park, where uh, author Thomas Wolfe spent some time while working. This house in Candler, Kenilworth Town Hall, this house in Enka, and the beach cabins, this advertisement from 1930 by Henry Talbot Sharp discussing the or promoting the construction of log cabins in beach up in Reams Creek for people who might be interested. These were available to the masses to build. And we see them all over the landscape. And I think when we encounter one, uh, we are struck by a nostalgia, by a love for the rustic that blends both our interest in you know, historic log cabins of the 18th and 19th centuries and the rustic of the late 19th century. Less frequently, but still fairly numerous, are the clusters of log cabins that were built as tourist courts beginning really in the 1930s. This is Foster's Log Cabin Court in Woodfin that was built beginning in 1931 or 1932 for the Foster family. Um, it was so popular in the mid-1930s, they added the restaurant building. In 1923, Samuel Childs built a house uh, just west of Laurel Park in Henderson County for his farm where he raised a special breed of chicken and gladiolas. Well, not long after he built that house, he established Brightwater's Cottages, built this stone hotel and a number of rustic log cabins for tourists coming primarily from Florida for the winter or for the summer. So this is the background, the general background. Let's take a look at Homeland Park specifically. E.G. Hester um, was born in 1865 in Kernersville and through the late 19th century was a buyer for R.J. Reynolds' company. In 1894, he married Elizabeth Smith, known as Bessie, not the Bessie Smith, but from Aiken, South Carolina. And in 1901, he moved to Tampa to take a position as general manager for the Havana American Tobacco Company. He was so prominent in this company, he fairly quickly rose through its ranks and became a third vice president and had to move to New York. Um, the company had offices in New York and factories in Tampa and Key West. He was often motoring around and taking trips on his yacht, the Flanker, to Cuba and the Keys with, um, with other businessmen and affiliates. He was given this 
what was referred to as a silver loving cup. I don't know what that is. But it was a token um, given to him by employees of the company when he left and went to New York. It was hammered silver with gold inlay. I do not have a good photo of Hester. All I've really got is this cup yet. Oh, back up. He was in New York for a couple of years. And then he quit the company in 1909 and moved back to Tampa to take up the auto industry. He was a principal in the Florida Gas, Gas Engine and Auto Supply Company, which sold Hudson's and Chalmers. And interestingly, E.G. Hester was a passenger in the second place winner of the Tampa to Jacksonville Great Endurance Race. He was an advocate of the Great Roads Movement. So he's in Tampa for a few years, and in 1912, he moves to Asheville and becomes president of the Kenilworth Development Company. Here he is with Jake Childs and Roland Wilson, the other principal, is there looking for investment and inspecting the land. I believe this is on the Patton Farm, Dale and James. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the old, old Patton. This. Okay, thank you. So here they are on the Patton Farm. The first of the plats of the Kenilworth Company laid out three areas that were, or three sets of parcels set aside for Childs, Hester, and Wilson. Childs built his first house at the corner of Kenilworth Road and Childs Avenue. Roland Wilson, shown here in his dress uniform from the Spanish-American War and later in his wedding photo to Martha, was president or vice president of the Tampa Box Company. I think that's how he and Hester get to know each other. Hester's in the cigar company. Wilson's making the boxes for those cigars. Wilson builds his house just a few parcels down, still there. Here it's shown in the early 20th century with Wilson sitting on the back patio with his dog, Checker Boy. A shout out to Zoe Ryan and the North Carolina collection. They have fantastic photos. And Hester, who is shown in the Tampa Times as doing great work in Asheville, had begun building his house. This is August of 1913. The work had begun on the houses of the three principals, Hester, Charles, and Wilson, and a couple of other gentlemen. But Bessie dies in December of 1913, and I don't think Hester finishes that house, because I think he had intended to build it here on this parcel that was set aside, but that's not his house, as far as I know. But this is the one photo that I have of him, shown from a distance at 8 Bowling Park on the porch shortly after the house is built. He remains president of the Kenilworth Company until 1918 when he resigns his position, interestingly, to go back into tobacco in Danville. And here is his resignation announcement. He's in Danville for a year or two, comes back to Kenilworth, and builds the Hester Log Cabin on Charles Avenue, 1920 or 1921. I'm not real sure what his business is in that decade of the 1920s, but his son Harvey is involved in real estate and uh, is one of the principals of one of Asheville's first bus companies, the Carolina Motor Stage Company. Fast forward, 1927, Hester marries Elizabeth Bernard, a local school teacher, interestingly, Thomas Wolfe's teacher, and they move to North Asheville. They're on Furman Street for a couple of years. So let's move from North Asheville over to East Asheville. This is the area in 1901, and just for reference, I've highlighted the Swannanoa River. This is the, roughly the alignment of uh, Biltmore Avenue at the time, and this is roughly Swannanoa River Road from the River Arts District over to Azalea Road. You could either, in 1901, follow the river and continue to Azalea, or you can take the high road. And just another reference point, that's Riceville Road, where our office is located. 
Homeland Park is located roughly there. At this time, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, it's fairly undeveloped. The largest installation is the U.S. Army Hospital at Oteen. But in the 1920s, Asheville develops the Asheville Recreation Park, which is a significant uh, tourist draw. Also at this time, we see the development or the platting of Beverly Hills in East Asheville. And again, for reference, this is the location of Homeland Park. In 1917, George Greenwood acquires some of this property and parcels it off. He's a local developer, a local Ashevillian. And between 1928 and 1932, Eugene Hester and Roland Wilson acquire parcels three, four, and five of this plat to develop Homeland Park, which is incorporated in 1932, and they immediately set about construction. This is the extent of Homeland Park today. I believe, I have not confirmed this, but I suspect that this was probably the Hester House because they lived on the property when they operated the tourist court. Just so you know, Eugene Hester, at the time they built the tourist court, was 67 years old. And here is that house. And they built the first 10 cabins in 1932. And I know that because this 1934 article, Tourist Camps Expect Good Summer Business, states the Homeland Park Camp, five miles from Asheville on Black Mountain Highway, 10 cabins. I believe these are some of those cabins, which would explain the difference in the design. They advertised locally and regionally. This is 1933, and it's nestled among a bunch of other uh, advertisements for some more prominent sites like the Fairfield Inn in Sapphire. And here's our um, advertisement for Homeland Park, which with a beautiful uh, little woodcut uh, illustration. Oh, and this Advertisement also refers to the newly opened dining room that is this building. They advertised in Tampa Bay. And in 1933, their first season, they had a good year with people coming not just from the region, Spartanburg, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Central and Eastern North Carolina, but they had patrons coming from Phoenix, from uh, Denver from Los Angeles. So there were people coming from all over the country and staying at Homeland Park. This was one of the first tourist courts in the area. It was so popular and the tourism industry in the area was booming that they had to respond to that with increasing their accommodations. This article from March of 1936 talks about new structures costing $142,000. 31 new lodges being erected at Homeland near City. It's one of the largest operations. Cottages built specifically for E.G. Hester. L.B. Jackson, noted Asheville developer, was the person who built these, or his company built them. The work cost $60,000. All of those cottages were three to five rooms in size. They added an on-site laundry and it was to be finished in 30 days. I have never seen this kind of detail in a newspaper article before. This is outstanding. That's, I believe, when this part of Homeland Park got developed. This is the 1936 expansion. And we see consistency. This makes sense because we see consistency in the buildings, these side gable structures, the front gable structures, there's, uh, they're all of a type and all of a period. And I believe that these rear extensions are from this period as well. If they weren't fully enclosed in 1936, I believe at least the framing was there for, say, porches. And this is when we get the iconic photographs or postcards um, that many people know of. I believe this is between 1936 and 1942. 
tourist camps boomed in the 1930s, in part because people with families didn't really want the formality of a hotel. They wanted the family feeling of the tourist courts where they could let their hair down. They, these places were often closer to um, regional amenities, like recreation park. And so it allowed them the comforts of home while on vacation. And in many cases, people brought pets with them. One article refers to people bringing their dog, a cat, or a canary bird. This is the advertisement for Homeland Park in that article from 1936. And this is the earliest of the brochures that we see for Homeland Park, um, managed by E.G. Hester. But it's a 60 cottage settlement. Now, I'm not good at math, but 10 and 31 is not 60. <laughs> and I think that there's a third period of construction here when we see these frame cottages built. They're frame and shingled. And I think this is a slightly later period of development um, before Hester dies in 1942. So he passes away. His wife, Elizabeth, is still living on the property. She's still managing Homeland Park. Three years later, oh, this is Elizabeth in 1950, so about that time, three years later, William Rhodes and Vaughn Cannon buy Homeland Park. They closed it for upgrades and then reopened it and operated it much as Hester did in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, home comforts were stressed. This is the importance, this is the value of the tourist courts. And this is when we see that large entrance sign come across the, the, the main entrance up Rhododendron. This is after the Rhodes, or Rhodes and Cannon purchased it. Now, this is Asheville in 1950, and these are the tourist courts and motor courts. It expands substantially from the few in the early 1930s because, of course, tourism has boomed. So in order to respond to all of this competition, they had to increase amenities. One of the things that Homeland Park did, the management did, was they would take guests in the summer over to the old farmer's ball in Swannanoa. And this is Bill Rhodes, the, uh, one of the owners, his wife, his older son and his wife, and their youngest son, Clinton, uh, whose acquaintance I've made over the past few years. And that is their manager, Mr. Bernard, who I believe is Elizabeth Hester, Elizabeth II, her brother. Her maiden name was Bernard. I think that he is related to her. They also had to improve their dining accommodations, because this is a period in Asheville where we see more restaurants developing. So they, a new uh, building is going up at the tourist court in 1948. Henry Irvin Gaines designed a building, but that's not what was built. Instead, we see it here in the brochure for Homeland Park Cottages, operated by Verna Humphreys. This is also the same time that co-owner Vaughn Cannon gets himself in a bit of a pickle. He is described in the newspapers as being the king bee of a four-state racketeering ring. So here's Vaughn Cannon and his attorneys in early 1949. Curiously, I have not attached any significance to this, but interestingly, in September of 49 is when they plat Homeland Park and start subdividing the properties. This is section A down toward the entrance. This is section B. It's also when we see changes to the restaurant. If you've ever driven past, oh, I don't, where's my current photo of the restaurant? Shoot. Anyway, there's supposed to be a photo in there that isn't, 
But if you know that great buff colored brick streamlined modern building that now houses the karate studio, that is the restaurant. And if you've wondered where that little hat comes from, it comes from 1951 when Harvey Hester, Asheville real estate developer, tour bus company owner, starts the Hillbilly Restaurant, a new type of eating place on Highway 70. Now, this I, I should have given a little bit of a trigger warning at the beginning, because this isn't the most sensitive of subjects. Um, this is, you know, possibly heinous today. Um, he hired a cartoonist out of Atlanta to do the advertising illustrations and to design and paint murals on the inside of the building depicting mountaineers. It was quite a draw. Um, we have a different sensitivity to this today. Harvey Hester also had some questionable practices regarding um, race relations. I'm not going to go into that right now because I'm not going to continue to victimize anybody. But let's just say that there is a little bit of a, of a murky history here as well that I won't get into. This is Harvey Hester in 1967. And this is when we see, it's, it's this change of the restaurant to the hillbilly restaurant, a different kind of eating place, that we see the branding for Homeland Park change from Homeland Park cottages to Hillbilly City, USA. But at the same time, they are adding amenities. They've added a riding ring and picnic grounds and stables and hiking and riding trails. The shuffleboard court, which is still there, was there in the Hester years. And on the eve of the opening of the Hillbilly restaurant in 1951, Mrs. Rhodes developed this uh, newsletter for patrons, building on the work of the Atlanta cartoonist. It's important to note, though, that this is part of a trend in the mid-20th century when we see this kind of caricature developed, um, not just for traditional mountaineers, but for people from the West. Uh, this was some of the pottery that was offered as souvenirs and used on the tables at the Hillbilly restaurant. This was produced by Jackson China out of Falls Creek, Pennsylvania, which used the same design for Wilson's restaurant in East Tennessee. The Mountaineer Inn was built in the early 1950s. Uh, the ghost town in the sky out in Maggie Valley opened in 1961. This is the hillbilly restaurant, insensitive as it is, and inappropriate as it is, is part of a mid-20th century trend. That doesn't make it okay, but I wanted to provide some background for those of you who may have seen the, the advertisement or the branding so that you saw the evolution of Homeland Park to this specific brand. Uh, Harvey Hester's company didn't last long because only a few months later, after it opened, they filed bankruptcy. This is also around the time that Von Cannon ended up going to prison, serving just under a year of his two-year sentence because he was convicted. And this is when we see the first sales advertisements for the, um, for the Homeland Park cottages. This is the largest of the advertisements that I've seen. More often, they're small little clippings in like the personal or real estate section of the newspaper. Four log and frame cottages, furnished or unfurnished. The Hillbilly Restaurant continues to be called that through the early and mid-1950s, even when it's padlocked for illegal whiskey sales and then extended for a year. And I think that's probably one of the reasons they got out of the business. <laughs> so Rhodes and Cannon, who at this point is, I think, out of jail, 
uh, sell Homeland Park to DA Dallas, who continues to sell those cabins individually. And the VFW acquired the Hillbilly Restaurant and continued to use that facility and I think contract out operation of the restaurant. And this is why it's the sale of these cabins from the early 1950s through the 1960s in that first phase of sales that we see the buildings change um, and be adapted for long-term occupation or in some cases seasonal occupation you know, depending on the motivations of the buyer and we see screened porches added at this time uh, this one is a little hard to see but there's a screen porch added to the side some of them are glass enclosed this is more recent and i think an excellent uh, approach to making a room um, year uh, uh, available for year-round use and additions that expand the usable square footage of the interior this is a modern um, it, it doesn't look modern I was surprised uh, closet enclosure over the original front door so the um, the access has been reoriented to the rear of the building through uh, the glass enclosed dining room frame enclosure such as this or larger uh, this is Ms. Salt's house larger additions that expand bedroom areas for growing families these all of these changes are part of Homeland Park's evolution over time so if you're familiar with uh, Foster's log cabin court in Woodfin, there's th those are really intact cottages. It is still operated um, as uh, short-term rental uh, housing for vacationers. Homeland Park's history is different, and the buildings reflect that difference. Um, it reflects the different history. It reflects that complicated history from the mid 20th century. So I think all of these changes in the aggregate help convey its layered development over time. The interiors in some cases might be very intact with closets added as needed in some cases, new floors have been added, um, built-in storage, because these are not large. For those of you who don't live there, we, we do have some residents here today, right? Raise your, yes, yay, thank you. Um, uh, if you don't live there, these are some pretty tight spaces. <laughs> um, kitchens updated as needed to meet modern needs and different approaches. In some cases, ceilings, where rot might have occurred, ceilings are replaced. But the interiors still convey that rustic sense of being early 20th century vacation cabins. So um, the next phase of today's program is a self-guided driving and walking tour. Jack. Do you want to pause here and talk about the work that the society is doing? And then I'll talk about the tour a little bit. So the, the Thomas Wolf cabin, which you saw a photo of uh, earlier in the presentation, is uh, a neighbor to the Homeland Park site. It's not within the, the formal compound of the property. It's kind of uh, it's a little bit further to the south. Um, sits on a large parcel of land. Um, it is uh, a designated local historic landmark, which means it has a level of protection uh, that is overseen by uh, the City of Asheville and Buncombe County through the Historic Resources Commission. The City of Asheville owns the property and it's on a relatively large site. It's associated with um, a lot of the parks uh, and recreation resources that are there at the uh, uh, soccer fields and the nature center and so forth. It sits on a bluff that um, uh, faces or presents to the south um, with the Swannanoa Valley coming in from the left and then um, the river down below. Uh, it's got a wonderful view of I-40 today. <laughs> um, 
So uh, just actually yesterday, the Preservation Society, uh, we were honored to provide uh, a level of funding to the city in the amount of $7,500 in a donation to support uh, a, a master planning effort that is already underway. Um, the city has engaged, uh, commissioned uh, a firm out of Atlanta by the name of Lord Atkins Sargent. Uh, they are uh, well known and highly respected for their historic preservation work. They have um, compiled a team that includes architectural historians, architects, landscape architects, and economists, that's a big one, um, to look at the, um, the prospects of what an adaptive reuse for this site can be, uh, a, su a sustainable adaptive reuse, which is very, very important because oftentimes uh, these historic resources need to find new life, right? Um, how do we keep them going um, with uh, sensitive alterations or new approaches uh, to their future. To date, there have been two public information gathering sessions. Uh, for, for those of you that are on our email list or getting those notices, um, uh, they were relatively well attended, I believe, and I think the consultants got um, a good amount of input. There were, there were also some specialty groups that were brought together to uh, provide feedback and interviews uh, to the consultants. Uh, of particular note was um, a group of local authors or those associated with um, uh, past authors uh, like Wilma Dykeman, Jim Stokely, her son was, was in the conversation. So that was very encouraging. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a rustic revival log cabin that's associated with one of, um, you know, Asheville's most notable native sons, Thomas Wolfe. And so there's a particular notion that perhaps this is an opportunity for our community to embrace the idea of uh, perhaps a literary or writer's retreat at the site. So that's something that folks are looking really hard at um, as they go through the master planning process. Um, sign up for our emails. We'll keep you in the loop on that. And um, Stacy, you may, I, I'm not sure if I've missed anything. I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay, great. So another public meeting later this spring, if you didn't hear that, that would be associated with this planning process for the Wolf Cabin. Uh, the Preservation Society is excited to be a partner with the city on this. We've, we've worked for, for quite a while on it. Um, some number of years ago, we put together, uh, through volunteer efforts, uh, an assessment of the building to help inform uh, city decisions on how to move forward for its restoration. We followed that up with a gift to the city in the amount of $10,000 to help with a stabilization and a selective demolition effort. The selective demolition was meant to peel back some of the layers that had been added on over time. A lot of times these old places are like onions and they've got layer upon layer upon layer. Sometimes you need to strategically peel some of that back to get back to the, uh, the integrity or the authenticity of the historic place. This is a third chapter in our work with the city to, uh, to bring back the wolf cabin. It will not be the final chapter. The effort here is uh, meant to inform a new use. A following chapter will be the initiation of a restoration program that is informed by that, uh, by that plan. So um, that's the update on the wolf cabin. Um, it's still kind of tucked away. We look forward to showing it off to everybody one day soon.